Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion, and I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Following me and sharing my videos is really very important because I am a one-man shop with absolutely no money for advertising or anything else, and so social media is the way that I grow. So please follow me at SYL Dales on Twitter and every other social media known to man. I have a list of them in the About page on this channel. I would appreciate your support via a page on my website, SYLRanch.tv, and I have a link to that in my description box. So today we have the 20th anniversary review of Star Trek Digital Ghost, one of the very first fan films. As a non-spoiler review, I can tell you that um, looking at it now um, from 20 years, amazingly 20 years, I'm astonished, after its production, a modern viewer might be inclined to think of it as rather crude. However, as this review will explain, there are many novel aspects to this production that you would probably surprise you. Now, unlike most reviewers, I don't just sit down and rehash the plot, pausing to say what I liked or didn't like. You'll always find much more depth from me than any other reviewer, touching on everything that goes into making a film or a TV show. And I can do this because a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I was once an actor, so I can speak with some authority. Not as much as a modern working actor, and I never want to give that impression, but with some authority. There's an old saying, those who can do, and those who can't teach. And the fact that I'm doing these reviews rather than actually acting probably means that I can't. <laughs> so, we will just take it as read that if you come to this video looking for a review you've already watched, Star Trek Digital Ghost, or you just don't care if it's spoiled for you. But nevertheless, for safety's sake, we should probably issue a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fandai master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me. Now, this isn't a boast or a brag. This is just where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years' worth of science fiction. The problem with fandai masters is that we are cursed. You just can't see all of this new stuff without seeing the entire century that came before. You find out that there's just not that much that is original, and it sometimes interferes with your ability to enjoy things. One thing I don't do is outrage reviews. There are a lot of reviewers on YouTube who are simply actors portraying outrage because they know that for The Last Jedi, that outrage sells. They hate everything as a knee-jerk reflex because the viewers want to see them hate things. And this causes a weird feedback loop between fans and popular reviewers where they go back and forth hating, 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 and eventually they can't like anything even if it's any good. But I don't do that. If I like something, I'll say why. If I dislike it, I'll say why, in detail. But I don't do outrage. Unlike other reviewers, I am the adult in this particular room. So, t today, with the review of Star Trek Digital Ghost, we can talk about the plot. As the film opens, a small spaceship enters a solar system where a Starfleet ship of a previously unknown design is in orbit of a Class M planet. The small ship fires something at the Starfleet ships that seems to envelop it. The film then shifts to a shot of the USS Enterprise-E, with a log entry by Captain Picard stating that Commander Stanley and Lieutenant Odyssey will be conducting tests on the new USS Enterprise-HC, a high-class vessel that is totally automated. The two officers beam over, with Lieutenant Odyssey being the more skeptical of the two of the design. And when they arrive, they find themselves weightless in the HC's transporter room, the computer having determined that gravity control was a waste of power for an unmanned ship. The computer then restores gravity, and the two officers drop to the floor rather unceremoniously. The two en enter a turbo lift, with Stanley discussing getting to know Odyssey better at some event due to take place soon, with the conversation having definite romantic undertones. The two then proceed to an eerily empty bridge that has no stations and only a single cylindrical pylon in the center that's part of the ship's computer. It has no traditional view screen, but rather a holographic display. The computer then manifests a human-female hologram named Roxanne to interfe interface with the two humans. 
Roxanne then sets a course to begin testing, narrowly avoiding the Enterprise E and scaring the two humans aboard in the process. During testing, a distress call is picked up. Roxanne can't identify it because it's distorted due to distance and an asteroid field between both the HC and the source of the distress signal. Roxanne sets a course for the source of the signal, though the course will take the ship directly through the aforementioned asteroid field, and this alarms the Starfleet officers as they believe the asteroid's too dense to navigate at such high speeds. Stanley orders Roxanne to change course, only to be informed that the humans are merely observers who have no authority to order her to do anything. She ins instead causes two chairs to emerge from the floor and invites the officers to sit down and enjoy the flight. The Enterprise HC enters the field at a high speed and with the shields down. When questioned, Roxanne insists that their shields are down because it's an unnecessary power drain. The Enterprise HC successfully navigates the field and intercepts a Beta-class starship built by a race called the Abraxer, whose engines appear to have failed. Stanley orders Roxanne to approach and prepare a tractor beam to take the ship in tow, only to be informed by Roxanne that she's already done so and has so informed the Abraxer captain. The Enterprise HC then takes the Abraxer ship in tow, and when Stanley asks why the shields haven't been raised, just as a precaution, Roxanne informs him that there is no sign of danger and the Abraxers have no aggressive tendencies that are known. But Stanley's unsure of this, and on further research, it's revealed that the Abraxers are in fact nomads and traders, survivors of a supernova that destroyed their home planet. Since then, they have been searching for a new planet. The Abraxas ship then fires on the defenseless Enterprise HC, revealing their true nature as pirates. Roxanne takes no action, neither raising shields nor returning fire. Now the captain of the Abraxas ship then contacts them and orders the Enterprise HC to surrender. Excuse me. Weapons, shields, and warp drive are now inoperative, leaving only the tractor beam, which is still functional and locked onto the Abraxas ship. Roxanne decides that the only way to avoid further damage is to immediately surrender. But Stanley objects to this. They can't let this ship fall into enemy hands, and he tries to use a code to override Roxanne, but she refuses his orders. Odyssey tries to phaser the bridge computer, but Roxanne has erected a force field around it. An alien program of some kind, apparently installed during the opening scene of the film, has taken over Roxanne and is forcing her to comply with the Abraxas' orders. Roxanne then attempts to erase the program, but in the process shuts off the gravity again. When she restores the gravity, only 60% of the alien program has been erased, and Roxanne decides that the only way to completely eliminate the program is to self-destruct the ship, and begins a countdown of five minutes. The holographic Roxanne disappears and the conventional bridge stations slide out from the walls on the floor. And Stanley takes over the helm and orders Odyssey to restore the ship's shields while the automated destruct continues to count down. Now Odyssey is able to restore the shields to 50%, but the tractor beam is still locked onto the Braxer ship, which continues to fire on the Enterprise HC. Stanley then pilots the ship back into the asteroid field and orders Odyssey to contact the Enterprise E. Within one minute until auto-destruct, the Enterprise HC drags the Abraxer ship through the asteroid field, causing damage to both vessels. And just as the Enterprise HC is being destroyed by the impact of a huge asteroid, Stanley and Odyssey are able to beam over to another asteroid with three force field projectors that maintain a livable environment on the asteroid. However, the Abraxer ship, still intact, makes an attack run on Stanley and Odyssey, and at the last possible moment, the Enterprise E arrives and dis disables the Abraxer ship. Out of control, it impacts an asteroid and is destroyed, but the debris is headed straight for Stanley and Odyssey. Odyssey confesses that she was looking forward to being with Stanley at the event that he mentioned earlier, and that candlelight could have been arranged. Moments before the debris crashes into them, Stanley and Odyssey are rescued by the Enterprise-E. Stanley realizes that in all the commotion, he lost his ticket to the upcoming event. He wants to beam back to get it, but Odyssey replies that she'll just have to go alone. The Enterprise-E leaves the asteroid field just as the force field dome of the asteroid to which Stanley and Odyssey had escaped flickers out. And in the final shot of the asteroid field, a FedCon 8 ticket floats past the screen, apparently the event that Stanley had been referring to. And scene. That thing with the uh, FedCon 8 ticket will make more sense in a minute.
the writers on this, because I always start out with talking about the writing, because without a script, you ain't got nothing to shoot. The writers here are Stephen Lenzen, writer, producer, post-production producer, assistant, cameraman, Just Van Vingarden. Uh -huh, I got his name right. And writer, director, producer, Thomas Wolf. Now, on their IMDb's, um, Stephen uh, 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 Lenzen, his IMDb shows him with the six writer credits. He was active. Uh, sorry, he was active. Well, active, he's only got six writer credits. Um, all of them for shorts or for short documentaries. Um, he has five director credits, all for films that he wrote. Five editor credits, all, well, almost all for films that he wrote. And one actor credit. Um, he's also got one a cinematographer credit um, and one self credit as he's a narrator in one of his documentaries. He's won no awards. Just Van Vingerden, still got it right. Um, his IMDb shows him active solely in 2000 with this film, and he was both the writer, assistant, camera, cameraman, and the producer, uh, a post production producer. He's won no awards. Then we have Thomas Wolf. Now, Thomas Wolf is kind of an interesting guy. Um, his IMDb um, shows him active from 1959 to 2018 so far. However, his first gig was when he did a voice for a TV series at age nine. Now, his next credited role wouldn't come until he was 19, and that's where his career actually started. He has 46 actor credits, including recurring roles on three different TV series, one writer credit, which is this film, one director credit, this film, and one producer credit for this film. However, Thomas Wolf is a really well-known German uh, for German dubbing of American films and TV shows. And these aren't listed on his IMDb, at least not on the English side, and I couldn't find any anywhere else. I frankly wouldn't have known ab about his rather incredible voice acting career if I hadn't stumbled across it on the German language Wikipedia entry on him. He has dubbed at least 83 different projects in film, TV, and video games. And the one that really struck out at me right at the beginning was that he voiced Hawkeye Pierce, the lead in the long-running TV series MASH. He did that voice for 10 years, and it appears to be what kicked off his voice acting career. He was also the voice of Commander Locke in Matrix Revolutions, and he voiced Colonel Clo Hogan in Hogan's Heroes. He voiced five different Danny Trejo roles, two Michael Madsen roles, and several Steven Seagal roles. He has, amazingly, despite all of that body of work, done no, won no awards. In terms of uh, the direction here, the direction actually is rather amazing. Uh, with regards to all the special effects, and I'm going to talk about why that is in a bit. There's nothing really earth-shattering with respect to the human characters, but one has to remember here that this was shot almost entirely with green screens, both for the background and the foreground elements. And while this isn't an amazing feat today, I mean, I use a green screen on every single one of my episodes, it is still extremely notable because this is the first time that was used in any major way, particularly in a fan production. In terms of the direction rating, I would give this sucker a 10 out of 10, largely because of the special effects and the difficulty of matching green screen footage of actors to not yet created effects and sets. In terms of the production, well, the story behind this production is kind of interesting and unlike many fan film productions, is pretty well documented. One of the world's largest Star Trek inventions, FedCon, takes place each year in Germany. I should mention, too, that this is a German uh, language uh, um, fan film, but it is dubbed in English, and it really doesn't uh, detract from your ability to enjoy it. But back in the 1990s, a young CG artist, CGI artist from Cologne, Germany, used to make starship animations that were shown at the beginning ceremonies of FedCon. In fact, he still makes them. The CGI artist in question was Tobias Richter of the uh, company The Lightworks, his company, and I will be talking about him a lot more later on in this review. But back in the 1990s, Tobias and his uh, eight-person company created the graphics for a number of video games and music videos. And in mid-1999, the Lightworks company, along with Film Wings Entertainment Production, which was one of the music video companies that Lightworks provided effects for, wanted to try something new involving the use of green screens to create virtual sets behind the actors. So the two decided to produce a mini Star Trek episode. Filmwings Entertainment Productions was responsible for the script, the actors, the music, and the filming. The Lightworks production handled all of the VFX, the digital sets, and the green screen integration. 
Now, to fund the project, Tobias Richter made a deal for FedCon to sponsor the film and to premiere at FedCon 8 in May of 2000, which is why we get that FedCon badge at the end of the thing. And uh, uh, Tobias Richter has said about this project, he's talked about it uh, explicitly, and I quote, We shot the actors in two days in a small studio near Luxembourg. I remember our two main actors very well. Eric was a German who lived in England and has appeared in a lot of very high-profile movies, including Saving Private Ryan and, more recently, Rush and Captain America the First Avenger. Kirsten was one of the first bunch of people who went into the Big Brother house on German TV. I remember that she just got the notice from the production company a few days before our shooting and was very excited about it. I think that we filmed sometime during autumn or winter and then had around four to five months of post-production. During that time, we had a rather huge staff at Lightworks due to other games in production. I think we were eight or nine people all involved at the point, in some point of the production process. And back then, green screen was a rather new thing to, uh, to us, and the tools were by far not as sophisticated as they are today. So a lot of work went in, and time went into each and every shot. With today's tools, it would probably take half the time. Um, but I have to say, we were all very exhausted when the production was done, and I stayed away from green screen for a long time after that. And that is what the end of what Tobias specifically himself had to say. So, we have to remember that while the use of green screen in fan productions has become commonplace, and in fact, occasionally, I, can, I know one specific fan film where it's totally seamless, this was a first. Now, unsurprisingly, Digital Ghost was a big hit at fan FedCon, and while the film wasn't uploaded to YouTube until about 2015, and only then, unfortunately, in 480p, it still remains a big piece of history. While it is not the first fan film, that honor goes to 1974's Paragon's Paragon. And by the way, if anybody can find me anything like a full clip of that, I mean, a full cut of that, I would be love to review that for this show. It has, however, this film become, it began the golden age of fan films that ran from about 2000 to 2016 when CBS killed fan films with their new fan film guidelines. And in fact, almost all of the fan films that I've reviewed or will review fall inside that golden age. As a production rating, um, due to it having been unique at the time, as well as its place in fan film history, I would rate this film's production as a 10 out of 10. In terms of the writing, well, Um, the idea, I have some great moments, I always say, try, to, try to say good things about something. The idea of an AI that's largely running a ship is something that should have come up in Star Trek The Next Generation's era. Given current technology, virtually everything aboard a starship in the far future will absolutely be run by an AI. And I gather that this is an idea that's being explored in Star Trek Picard. However, as I bailed on that show after episode 5 due to its extreme nihilism, I wouldn't know for sure, and frankly, I don't care. Uh, other good uh, moments, the weightlessness of, at the beginning was kind of funny. Uh, beaming down to an asteroid with a hastily effect erected uh, makeshift force field was a neat idea. Stanley hitting on Odyssey was nice. Um, you frankly don't see this enough, frankly, in Star Trek. And, of course, I'm not even sure that you can do it today. It might be classified sexual assault. I do have cringe moments. Frankly, the premise of the film kind of makes no sense. If you have a fully fu automated ship, there's really no reason for it to be anything other than just a propulsion and sensor platform. It shouldn't be very large and would really have little to no accommodations for humans. There's certainly no reason for it to be apparently about the size of the Enterprise-E. And then the plot point of the Enterprise-HC computer being infected with a virus wasn't apparent on my first viewing. It was only on my second that I kind of put two and two together. Then there's the film. It comes off uh, kind of like a VFX demo reel with a uh, rather thin plot attached to it. I mean, admittedly, it's only about 20 minutes long, but Star Trek the Animated Series had full scripts that were that long. So in terms of the writing, uh, rating I would give it, I would say the script would have to get a rating of about 5 out of 10. While it was certainly a very innovative use of effects, the script itself is not very good. Then we come to the acting with Kirsten Klins as Lieutenant Odyssey. Um, 
her IMDb shows her only active in 2000. Uh, she has three acting credits, this, a TV movie, and a TV series. Now, she has three self-credits, and that includes being on the German version of the non-reality show Big Brother. She received notice, as I said before, that she's accepted for Big Brother just a few days prior to shooting Digital Ghost. And just a note here about reality shows. As a former actor, I can tell you that they're complete fiction. As my late, great acting guru, Dr. William Morgan, once said, theater is planned, rehearsed spontaneity. In order for any reality shows to be anything other than stultifyingly boring, they must, to some extent, be planned. At the very least, somebody is pointing the camera and somebody's doing the editing. Theater is planned and rehearsed spontaneity. And Kirsten has won no awards. In terms of her performance, well, despite being a relative novice, Glenn's acting here is competent, believable. Her being resistant to Stanley's advances was kind of good, as was her reversal in what she believed would be her last moments alive. And while cliched in terms of the script writing, it is still well played. There are places, particularly when she's skeptical of the whole idea of an automated ship, where it doesn't really come off well. One cannot, with this film, n not be reminded of Dr. McCoy's reactions to the M5 computer in the Star Trek the original series, The Ultimate Computer. McCoy was deeply against the idea, in a very emotional way, that Klins doesn't really project. Um, her lines say it, but she doesn't. Don't know if that's her or the direction. But because of that, as a rating for her acting, I would have to give her about a 7 out of 10. Um, she does well with just about everything um, but being skeptical about this fully automated ship. And I have to tell you that as a former actor, I hate giving out anything other than glowing reviews. But it is what it is. I know that for a lot of actors, it's tough to take negative notices. Um, but, you know, guys, I just have to tell you, don't, don't worry about what I say. You just keep, keep on keeping on regardless of what the critics say. You know, we're the ones who can't. <laughs> then we have... Judith Horsch as the uh, Roxanne, the artificial intelligence, running this show. Her IMDb lists her as active 2000 to present, with Digital Ghost being her very first gig. She has, so far, 63 acting credits, with one completed and one in post, almost exclusively German TV, with multiple recurring leads and uh, recurring roles in various uh, TV series, and she has done some films. She has two all writer credits as well. She has won an award, the Anatomy Crime and Horror Film Festival Award in 2018, for Best Supporting Actress for the film Ingenium. As a performance, um, she's fine here. She's fine. She plays a perfectly calm, unemotional AI that's been infected with a virus. There is very little um, to stretch her talents and show because the script demands very little. There's a point at which she sort of as a self-aware computer, says that she hopes that she's lived up to their expectations, you know, even though she was infected with this virus. And that's a nice little moment. But, you know, in terms of rating her, uh, it's really impossible for me to rate. She, she plays a calm, unemotional AI for the most part. I mean, how do you rate that? There's nothing here showing range. She plays that fine. 10 out of 10 for that, I guess? I don't know. Then we have Eric Redman as uh, uh, Commander uh, uh, Stanley. Now, his IMDb shows him active from 1995 to present with 53 acting credits. He played Schneider in Captain America, the first Avenger, and he's done a mix of German and English and American work, and he has multiple recurring roles in multiple TV series and has won no awards. In terms of his performance, um, despite being the most experienced actor, his performance is remarkably unemotional. He only gets real stressed when he's screaming about how they need to be beamed off the ship to get to the asteroid. He is better when dealing with hitting on uh, Odyssey and then not being able to find his FedCon 8 ticket. Uh, but he's still kind of bland throughout. Um, for him, I'd probably have to give him a 4 out of 10. Um, unlike many uh, fan productions, a lot of fan productions, I am a lot less critical of the acting because they are essentially fans who are the actors. you got to cut them some slack. But these were all professional actors with Redman having the most experience. There should have been more from him here, I think. Then we have the cinematography, and that includes a lot about Tobias uh, Richter. 
His IMDb shows him active 1991 to present with one in post. He has 24 visual effects credits with numerous fan productions, among them Star Trek New Voyages Phase 2, which I, I will review at some point, Star Trek Renegades, which I will review at some point, Prelude to Axanar, and I think he's probably working on the Axanar um, uh, fan film stuff as we speak. He worked as a 3D model designer on the recent documentary, What We Left Behind, Star Trek and Deep Space Nine. His CGI Starship models have sometimes been placed in the public domain or were licensed for use by other fan productions. He also has four art department credit, and this includes his first credited pr uh, production as graphic artist for the 1991 video game, The Manager. He has three animation department credits, two special effects department credits, and two editor credits. He has won the Streamy Awards in 2018 for Best Visual Effects in a Web Series for Atropa. And then we have, he, he's amazing, he's just amazing. I cannot, I cannot stress enough just how amazing his art is. And then we have, uh, sorry while I get it back up here, uh, Wolfgang Vessman. He is the uh, other cinematographer here. Uh, his uh, IMDb, he shows him active 1995 to present with one in post. He has a 73 a camera and electrical department credits, which usually means he's the guy behind the camera. He has three cinematographer credits, two art department credits, and he has won no awards. Now, in terms of the cinematography here, we have to put this together. You know, we have the live action, and then we have all of the stuff that Tobias Richter was doing. There is, in terms of the stuff, it's nothing less than fantastic with respect to a lot of things. Tobias Richter was clearly responsible for everything from the green screen background and foreground effects to all of the space CGI, which all of which is great. And while this was very much the beginning into what would have made Tobias Richter famous in the fanish world, he completely delivers here on every level, as he always does. In terms of the human cinematography, well, this was, again, utilizing green screens for every element and therefore extremely difficult to shoot. Um, it's not incredible in terms of what you see, but you have to remember they're trying to marry things that were going for footage that hadn't yet been created. It was going to be done in post. Um, so it does a pretty good job of that. Uh, today it looks a little crude, but back then this was brand new. It was, the, it was the beginning of the golden age of fan films. So it's a rating for the cinematography, 10 out of 10. Just straight up 10 out of 10. It was great. The production design has no one listed. However, uh, the sets and almost everything was probably a collaboration between uh, Thomas Wolfe and Tobias Richter. I suspect that Richter probably had more to do with it than anyone else. Most of the action takes place on the bridge of the Enterprise HC, and it's uh, really very odd. You know, it's kind of creepy to an audience used to seeing um, you know, console-filled bridges just to have a large cylinder in the middle of an empty bridge. Again, it was very effective. So uh, I would rate that, um, you know, this part of it, the production design, 10 out of 10. Um, Tobias Richter does an amazing job, as he always does. Now the music on this, the music on this is, uh, the musical director was Roman Shansi. Now uh, he was, um, his IMDb lists him as active um, um, from 2000 on, and 2000 only, sorry, but this is his only credit. However, IMDb does not show the many, many bands that he's been a member of, musical bands. He has done vocals, guitar, and bass for numerous bands since the 1990s, and he's won no awards. The musician listed on this is uh, Kemi Vita. Her IMDb also shows her only active for this one credit. However, again, IMDb does not show the many bands that she's been a member of. Um, she's done vocals and bass, again, for many bands since the 1990s and has won no awards. Now, the music here. From the credits, it would seem likely that uh, Roman Shaughnessy was responsible for the score but it was performed by a band called The Dream Side, which was formed uh, by Kemi Vita in 1994, and still has Vita on vocals and Shaughnessy on bass. The music was entirely synthesized. Now, while I understand the impossibility of using an orchestra under these circumstances, I don't find the score all that effective. It's not bad with beauty shots in space, but not so good when it comes to the action. So I would have to rate this basically a 7 out of 10. The special effects. Well, see Tobias Richter. <laughs> the only thing that I might mention is that the Abraxer captain is also CGI. And as always, 
Tobias Richter brings his brilliance to this in a seamless way, so we give any special effects 10 out of 10. No costumer is listed for this show. Um, however, the costumes are consistent with late uh, Next Generation era costumes. However, they're generally rather oversized and ill-fitting. Now, I'm not inclined to overlook this, as I've been involved with myself. Many low-production theatrical productions, that low-budget low rather, that still have well-fitted effects, uh, well-fitted costumes. I'm afraid on this one, guys, I'm going to have to give you a 3 out of 10. Could have done those costumes a lot better. The makeup has Frank Hard uh, listed as the makeup artist. His IMDb shows him active from 2000 to 2010. Digital Ghost was his first gig. He has eight makeup department credits, including seven episodes of Makeup and Hair on a single series, and he has won no awards. The makeup here is really all what I kind of call practical. Um, it's, it's, there's no alien makeup involved here. It's just making sure that you look good on screen and it being practical like that, um, it's just doing, it's overcoming the effects of lighting and where you have to put people on the stage and all that. It, it's fine. I, I would give it a rating of 10 out of 10 simply because it just always works. <laughs> so at the end of any review, we ask ourselves, is it any good? Well, as I say, I would absolutely, I would absolutely recommend this film. I mean, it's only 20 minutes of your life, after all. And even at the low resolution available on YouTube, and I have a link to that in my description box, you can still see that a hell of a lot of care was being taken, as is anything with Tobias Richter's name on it. Um, it is also the vanguard. Again, it holds a place in fanish history as being the vanguard of the golden age of fan films and can be at least appreciated on that level. So if a rating on this, I would give it a 10 out of 10. Well, it's not the best fan film ever produced. It is obviously one of the best early films and, again, was the vanguard of the golden age that we now no longer have. So, that's all I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to get back to you. So, a little bit of ad copy in the immortal style, badly, of Ernie Anderson, one of those voiceover guys you always used to hear, usually on ABC. He was the voice of ABC for quite a long time, and he was, in fact, doing uh, promos for Star Trek The Next Generation. So, tomorrow on the Fandime Masters live action watch party reaction of Batwoman. Kate begins to question her instincts, and Luke gets upsetting news. Now Alice sees her, uh, seeks her sister's help with a special task. Plus, I'm really, really gay. That's tomorrow on the Fandai Masters live stream watch party reaction of Batwoman. Watch live on YouTube tomorrow, March 22nd, 2020 at 6.45 p.m. Central, 5.45 p.m. Mountain, 4.45 p.m. Pacific in North America. That time again is live on YouTube tomorrow, March 22, 2020 at 7.45 p.m. Eastern, 6.45 p.m. Central, 5.45 p.m. Mountain, and 4.45 p.m. Pacific in North America. So, thank you for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.